to see if I'm in the center or not. <laughs> I already flipped it. So, it, we're on time, 3 o'clock, and let's get started with our usual uh, protocol. We will start with uh, our 30 seconds of quiet time for <clears throat> any um, restoration you need to do with the, uh, with the Lord, any attitudes or anything like that, or if you're already in fellowship, then it would be just a matter of praying for something, petition, like concentration, understanding, uh, things like that. So let's start with 30 seconds of quiet time, and then I'll initiate it with, uh, with prayer. Dearest, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time we're together in your word. Help us to understand these principles. Help us to set everything aside so we have no distractions to the time that uh, your Holy Spirit is teaching us from your word. I pray, Lord, that um, you'll just give us these doctrines so that we can be fully equipped <clears throat> to defend ourselves, to know what the source of power is and the source of truth, that we may, may not be defeated by our greatest enemy. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so today, this Sunday, December the 12th, 2021, and we're going to be talking about the devil's strategy. Uh, that's his plan. His plan has been pretty consistent, and uh, we'll talk about who he is. And this is how, how, the, how Satan um, deceives the human race. The human race, meaning everybody, will get down into believer and unbeliever. Uh, and hopefully you have the notes um, sent out. If not, then uh, let Jeannie know and she'll uh, send them to you so that they're available. I think they're actually available on the site too. And this will be the ones that are um, shown there. So um, let's get started. How, the, how, how, the, how Satan deceives the human race. Um, and I, I have a quote there <coughs> that, um, yeah, there it is. It's uh, Revelation 13, 11. And um, this is one of the things to keep in mind. Uh, it's a reference to the false prophet that's in the tribulation for Israel. And he is the false prophet and the false Christ. We studied him very deeply in Revelation 13, 11 when we were studying Revelation. And it says, he had two horns like a lamb. That's the outside. But he, spoke, but he spoke like a dragon. And that is the key to um, the understanding, is that in reality, when you look at a teacher or a pastor, you are actually to ignore what you see and maybe even what you hear with respect to the way he presents it. Uh, an example is that if you probably listen to Isaiah, Isaiah probably would chomp on everyone's butt. Uh, if you look at his, his writings, that's exactly what he did. He's very, most people, Isaiah would be thrown out of almost every church in America today um, because he's just too gruff. Um, in reality, Jesus probably would be too with his first comment, get behind me, Satan, right? When he's talking to Peter, one of his own disciples. But if we were listening to Timothy, um, like in the book of Ephesus, I'm sure we would love Timothy because he was very sweet and he was very kind. Although he is also ch he is chastised in 1 Timothy uh, very, very harshly by Paul for being such a sissy pastor. And that wasn't one of being a dictator. That was one of holding the truth above everything else to people's feelings, to what they thought, which is what you see in Paul and you also see in Jesus and you also see in Isaiah and Jeremiah who, uh, who all got into big trouble because of the way they presented the Word of God. He spoke like the lamb. He actually sometimes looked like the dragon, I think. So that is one of the important things to do, is that the, the distinguishing mark is the Word of God, as we've talked about over and over and over again. <clears throat> now, um, I want to just say who he is first, but I want to also talk about demon possession and a demon influence. They are very different. 
Um, also, I wanted to go through the book for a second. This, this, all of this comes from these three people. Um, actually, uh, C.I. Schofield probably would be before this, and many other people. But I always talk about Lewis Perry Schaefer. He's the founder of uh, system, uh, systematic theology and the founder of the uh, of Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, so his name is uh, Lewis Perry Schaefer, and two of his students, two of his found really excellent students, there's been many of them, including people like John MacArthur and, and others, but is R.B. RB Thiem Jr. Uh, and um, Merle Unger, who are both with the Lord right now. This is the Unger Dictionary. He also writes an excellent book called what, what, what the Devil Can Do to You, What the Devil Can Do to Believers. He also writes another great book called The Crystal Ball, in which he talks about our own time, actually back to 1970, when he discusses the uh, enormous amount of demon influence among believers. Now, in reality, what he was talking about back then, which started in the, in the, in the 60s, and he wrote that book in the 70s, was really talking about what has consummated into where we are today where the church has been so vastly influenced by evil uh, and, hu and humanism um, that it has is, is essentially been, um, um, what's the word for it, diminished. Our ministry has been diminished because the people that God chose to be the light have been dimmed and some extinguished and some actually um, proselytites or evangelists for the devil himself. Okay, so uh, so if you had to look at this today, what I'm really saying is that Satan has managed to kick the church's butt. Okay, which is why we're having all the troubles we're having today. Now, demon possession and demon, demon influence. It's important to know the difference. The between unbelievers and believers, in reality. Satan or demons cannot possess a believer and that is because the uh, Holy Spirit indwells them and cannot take over their soul with or without their influence uh, or their even permission. <clears throat> so he cannot do that. Now you might be wondering why we have so many evil believers. Uh, and I'm not just talking about Congress. That was a joke, okay. But um, in reality, what happens is they fall under what's called a, a, um, demon influence. And the demon influence is when the false doctrines that we'll be talking about are replaced, uh, replace the Bible doctrines, the divine doctrines that are in the scriptures. So what happens is that um, the kernel, uh, R.B. Thiem talks about this as reversionism. It's a coined word. He coins lots of words uh, that help you uh, understand the entire concept in a single word, which is why we use some of them. <clears throat> but the principle is that what happens is that uh, when a person uh, comes as a believer, they have more and more Bible doctrine, they act from that. But as they get pushed away by something, and we talked about them, we were talking about uh, Philippians, as you have an issue that you have a problem with, with one of your teachers or your pastors who teach the truth of the Word of God, what it does is it skews you off to the side, meaning that you have accepted a false principle because you don't like that guy, or you find something that you don't agree with, okay? And your only agreement is is with the Word of God as a believer. It's not with the individual. I, an example is that I'm absolutely nobody, okay? I am nobody in anybody's way except my wife loves me, okay? And the Lord loves me. And I love to study the Word of God, and that's why I teach this, because He has given me a gift to do that. But in reality, I am not important in one tiny bit. What is important is what I am telling you with respect to the Word of God. And that's why I give you so many verses, so that you can you don't have to take my word. You can look at it too, okay? Um, uh, I don't go on and talk and talk and talk for an hour and then give you two verses. I don't start out with a little tiny verse and then talk about it for an hour. What I do is I take you verse by verse by verse by verse, and anything I tell you as a principle, I enforce it with multiple uh, scriptures, which I could actually put many more. But I try not to overdo that. In my old class, when those you have to, used to have to suffer, I would actually read all those verses to you, which I knew was very painful. Uh, is because I wanted you to understand how what those verses meant and how they proved 
what I was saying there. So you can look at them yourself because it is, it is the Word of God that makes a person a, um, a, a true teacher or a liar. Okay? And like we said in this very beginning here with, with the false prophet is that he looked like a lamb and many people today in the churches are pastors who teach in churches or even teach in Bible studies. And what they do is they look very nice, they act very nice, they're very polite, they probably wear a tie and, and they wear a coat, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, <clears throat> but what happened is what they say out of their mouth, like it says here, he spoke like a dragon. Okay, now this is the Holy Spirit's um, viewpoint of the false prophet, and it's a true one, obviously. So the, the point is that the more truth that you know about the Word of God, the more that you are able to discern one from the other. Now one of the problems we have with that is many people have been taught false doctrines. And what happens is that they've never really looked at that Word of God to see it. So what happens is that they actually don't have the ability to discern truth from fiction. The falseness of, of, the, of the world, of the, uh, meaning Satan's system, and the truth of the Word of God. Which is why we always talk about spiritual maturity requires more and more and more doctrine. Can you get too many Bible studies? Yes, you can. When you can actually get 25 hours of Bible study in 24-hour day, maybe you should worry. But until then, I would say you're probably pretty safe. <clears throat> and the truth is you can't have too much doctrine. You can't have too much truth. It is the deciding point of whether somebody is telling you the truth or whether they are telling you a lie, even if they believe that lie to be true. Okay? And many, many uh, believers today do not know Bible doctrine. And we brought that up in Hosea 4.6, where a nation, in this case is the nation of Israel, was destroyed because his people did not obey the truth of the word. They didn't know it. And we know that from Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for lack of wisdom. Wisdom is the word of God. <clears throat> we are going through that exact problem today, that this country is being destroyed, not from the unbelievers, but from the believers who do not have the truth of the Word of God, and therefore their light is dim, and therefore that light doesn't cast out. Because trust me, unbelievers know light when they see it, as does Satan. Okay? <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about the, the, human, the demon possession to fend it off. Okay? So what happens is that an unbeliever can be demon-possessed. Okay? We know about that from the, from the Gospels. We see the piece where the Gatterdeans uh, were the where the one is possessed who comes out of the cave and cuts himself. He is truly possessed and truly an unbeliever. But, the, he can, but a believer cannot be possessed by a demon, like the other guy was, uh, by legions. But he cannot be because he has the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not allow it. Okay? End of conversation. The weakness of the demon cannot overpower the power of God in the believer. Okay? But what can happen is that that can't part, but what happened is that the, the believer can be uh, demon-influenced by taking on false doctrine, okay? And we talk about that. <clears throat> Many, the majority of believers today have much, much false doctrine. They can't tell the truth from a lie. So when somebody preaches it or teaches it, or they even see it in the world, they take it on. They are the people who look with many times from a position of emotion, rather than a position of doctrine, okay? Um, and we'll talk about it. But that's the essential difference uh, between the two of them, and it's a critical difference to know, okay? Can a believer start out really good and become evil? Absolutely. What happens is that that believer may have had Bible doctrine, may have... To, we see this happen all the time. <laughs> we see this happen in universities, one of the best examples, you send your Christian kid off to college and they come out almost possessed, okay, but they can't be. What happens is that those teachers and teachers of those classes teach demonism over and over and over again. They teach humanism. They teach false doctrine. Anybody who's had a kid go to college knows that. It twists their entire mentality to pretty soon all they have left in their mind because they've taken it in. Because of what? Peer pressure, things like that. <clears throat> they take that in, and they are converted. Now, are they saved? Absolutely. 
They're, go they're going to pop up in heaven no matter what happens to them. But they come home spewing all this rubbish from the world, all this demonic uh, uh, demon uh, doctrine. And you wonder what happened to your child. It's because they have been influenced because that is one of the strategies of Satan is to overcome the universities and the high schools. And you now see it happening in uh, elementary schools with critical race theory. They are, they are indoctrinating the changing that child from what you have taught them to the doctrine of demons. So that's what you see. You see, a parallel example of this, is you see this happen in Congress. Where in Congress, you have people who are really good men and good women who have great values. And many times they have, they're very righteous with respect to God. And what happens is they find that system just tortures them and twists them. And then pretty soon, they become this, this liberal. Uh, they become this liberal in their thinking. They stop standing for what God has taught them. And this is very, very common. Okay, uh, They get influenced by all those things because Satan figures them out. Okay, He figures them out. And what he does is he takes that. So let's get to those two pieces. So you can see that in examples. You can see it in many, many examples. So we know that is true. So let's go to the outline where we talk about the devil is a prehistoric super creature, uh, angelic creation. Okay, uh, during the angelic creation. And prehistoric meaning previous to our time. And I have a bunch of verses there. I'll talk about a particular one. But what we need to understand about Satan is that Satan is not the way we think he is. See, what, what we think is that Satan looks like and sounds like what he produces. Okay? Uh, which is this evil sin and all these things like that. Um, and believe it or not, much of what Satan produces from his system is not how it sounds. Okay, it sounds very good, but in reality, it always produces rubbish. Now, the example I would like to use is that when you think about the having no borders in the South, that sounds like a really good idea until you have millions of criminals and terrorists coming through those people, and you see the you, what looks like a very good principle. We should share. We have so much wealth. We should have. Everybody should be come over anytime they want to. But what you see is the results that you now see. You see disaster. You see the things that, okay, you know, the policemen are too hard. Maybe if we're just really nicer to the criminals, they'll get better. It, we have, what, nine cities, nine major cities, all controlled by the left, um, 12 cities actually, who have, who have crime rates that this year are bigger than they've ever been, and they actually beat last year's, which was the biggest it had ever been. Okay, and this is, this is, these are ones that are controlled by the left. So what it means is that, in reality, being nice to criminals does not work. Now, if they read that in the Word of God, chap chapter 13 of, Re of Romans, they would have realized that was true, but they don't. So they take something that when you hear it, it sounds so good, but in reality, when you implement it, it is absolute disaster, and many innocent people are murdered, harmed, and destroyed by those principles. So that's what it looks like. So I want you to look at, devil as, at the devil as that kind of creature. In reality, is that uh, there, he is, if you were to look at him, he would look beautiful. He is the most beautiful creation made by the hand of God as an individual creature. He is also the most intelligent. He is the most eloquent. I mean, he actually got one third of all the angels of heaven to come on his side. And they are infinitely, they are many, many thousands of times smarter than us. And they have lived for who knows how long. And they have seen everything, yet they were completely persuaded by this one creature. Okay? So, in reality, he also says that his voice of singing is like that of a pipe organ. He has a beautiful voice. Chances are that if he walked into a room, everybody would just go, Who is this wonderful person? And when he spoke, they would go, Tell us more, tell us more. Okay? So that's who he is in reality. He's not this little pointy-eared, red, devil, devilish looking thing like we imagine. In reality, he would look like Bill Clinton used to look in the old days. I just, I couldn't let that go. Okay? But let's pass that aside. But in reality, when evil speaks, it speaks eloquently. Okay? Beautifully. It makes complete sense to our minds. Uh, and that's why the Lord tells us, 
that his thinking is so far above our thinking as the heavens are above the earth. It's because it's not like we think. It's not like we can imagine. The cross should tell us that. The cross would never come to a person as the solution, which is why Satan didn't expect to be condemned by destroying the Christ. Okay? So this is who we need to look at him. Now he's identified, I'm going to use Matthew 12, 26, but you can look up all those other verses. I give them to you in advance so you can look them up and, and know what we're going to do. It says, if Satan drives out Satan, this is the words of Jesus, drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How can his kingdom stand? Okay? Now, first of all, I want you to know that Jesus himself identifies Satan as a real, real creature, as a real individual. And this is, you remember this discussion, I took it because of this. And he also says, says um, how can his kingdom stand? Okay? Um, what I want to say about this piece here is that it lets you know that Satan has a kingdom meaning a kingdom that is external to us as believers, okay? In reality, um, we all came from this kingdom, all of us. You were born into it, okay? Uh, with the sin nature, you were, oh, you were born as a sin to slave, uh, as a slave to sin. In reality, you were born into this kingdom. Every single uh, human being that has ever lived uh, was born, was born into his kingdom. Uh, in reality, we are saved out of that kingdom, okay, uh, of Satan. But we did once belong to him. All of us did. Um, the, one of the things that's confusing to us is as human beings, and we've talked about this all the time, is human good versus human evil. Now, human evil is actually the title to how Satan thinks. And in reality, we, when we, we designate human evil to identify the sinful side of it, okay, where it actually has a sin to it. But in reality, much of what Satan does is good from a human point of view. It's called humanism. It's also called human good. And we know where that comes from because we are familiar with in the garden with the, with the tree of uh, good and evil. Okay? Whatever it was about good and evil in that tree, in reality it was human good and human evil. Hu human beings did not, it, were, were not supposed to have it. That's why it was forbidden by God himself, by Jesus in the garden. He forbid it, right? It was the only way in which they could sin and lose fellowship with God. But it had both of those, because the question people always ask is, what's wrong with the good on the tree? Why, why, why couldn't it just be the, the tree of evil? Well, in reality, it was good and evil because the good part was the part that would look good to us, okay? It looks like the right solution, okay? It looks, human good is used all the time by, uh, by uh, believers and unbelievers. In fact, uh, unbelievers can only do human good and they can sin, but in reality, uh, believers can do human good too, and we talk about that all the time. But that is, that is a creature solution to the problems of mankind. And you've seen some of them already. We've talked about them, right? No border, you know, the, no policemen. You know, you go on, we go on and on with them. But they, what they do is that human good never works. It actually always destroys things when you're ultimately done with it. So when the Word of God is given to us by God, the purpose of the Word of God is to keep us out of trouble, is to give us a solution that is a divine solution that will always work. It, it's kind of like, I look at it as that, it's kind of like the stop sign, uh, it's kind of like the, the, uh, the rails on the, on the freeway as you go over the bridge. Why are they there? Well, they prevent you from flying off the bridge, okay? A stop sign prevents you from running into somebody going the other direction. Okay? That's what the Word of God is like. They are permanent solutions. And what happens is when you obey them, you, 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 you go through life, and in every aspect of our lives, our life is, becomes blessed. It becomes blessed as a result of us following these principles. Okay? So that's where, that's where that fits in. In reality, God's solutions are always perfect and always work 100% of the time. Okay? Um, so let's go to the next piece. Um, there were three falls of Satan. Okay, there are three falls of Satan. Uh, in reality, uh, many times we don't uh, understand them. And there's Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Revelation that, were, that are listed here. But I'm just going to quote Isaiah 14, 12. Just a piece of it so we can look at it. And then I'll tell you what the three falls are. He says, um, Isaiah says, uh, How you have fallen from heaven, uh, morning star, son of the dawn. Now this was Lucifer's name. 
uh, Lucifer's name was son of, uh, morning star, son of the dawn, which is what Lucifer means. And so it's identifying him his, uh, before he became known as Satan and the devil in our time. So this is pre-human history. And this was the first fall. And we know that from the five I wills. Um, we've talked about them before. Uh, and then it says, goes on to say, you have been cast to the earth, you who once laid uh, low the nations. Now that's a prophecy. And we remember that prophecy because it comes in Revelation 12, right? Um, we, read the, we read through that one where he's cast out of heaven with, with his angels, with his demons. Um, so that one, but the, the falls happen, and, and, and you have to understand the falls to understand these pieces. He will fall in the future, prophecy, the one is talking about in the second half of this verse, but he has fallen before. So when he was thrown out of prehistoric heaven because of the uh, uprising, um, we won't go any further than that, we'll just leave that alone. We know that he is thrown out of heaven in the future, in the middle of the tribulation, from Revelation 12, we studied that. And we know that he is also, at the end of the tribulation, he is imprisoned into Hades, okay, we know that, and then let out, and then ultimately brought to the lake of fire. So that is who this creature is, and that's where he's going. Um, see, on the, the next point on this thing is, is the devil is the central antagonist in history means that through all of human history, and even angelic history as of the fall, he is the central antagonist. He is the most powerful one. He is centered. Many times when people say, the devil is after me, they are not talking about the devil because the devil wouldn't be interested in them. You have to be somebody of significance, like Paul and Jesus, for, for Satan to spend his time. But he is the author of of that central antagonist in history. He is always behind the evil. It is his strategy that he has that continuously uh, uh, goes against God and God's people. Um, and when I'm taking the verse here of, of the many that are here, uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, and this is talking about Christ himself, but look at what it says here, which is what I'm looking for. He says, uh, since, the ch since the children have flesh and blood, that's us, uh, he too shared their humanity. That's Jesus Christ. Okay, came came in the uh, um, as a man, and so by his death, the death of Christ on the cross, he might break the power of him. That's Satan, who holds power of death, holds the power of death. That is the devil. So it tells us who he is, and free those. That's a consequence of the of the, the power that Jesus relieved at the cross, and to free those uh, whose all their lives were held in slavery, and this is the point here, by their fear of death. Okay? <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that Satan holds that, and he holds that fear, which is why we covered it in the first lesson, first two lessons, actually. But the fear of death is one where you, the fear of death distracts you from um, actually implementing the Word of God. So Satan, in order to do that, has to stir it up all the time. Uh, you see that commonly when we have right now, when you turn on television, there's always this element of death and fear and, for, and foreboding um, that, um, that we see. And this is how he controls people. And this is what he has. But the point of this whole thing is that Jesus has overcome that and by his death, and by his resurrection, we have no issues with death as believers. And when we do have an issue, it prevents us from implementing the plan of God in our lives because we're acting like the world, okay? Who are afraid of death and should be. <laughs> uh, the next point is devil has an organization. He has a kingdom, just like the one that was, was talked about in the verses, in that very first verse we read out of Matthew 12. But it talks about it here in uh, Ephesians 6, 10, and 12. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, um, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So this tells us a whole bunch of things. It says that even though you see somebody do stupid, evil things, and you want to choke their neck to hope that gets that out of them. In reality, the Bible tells us that the, the, the thing you want to choke out of them, you can't choke out of them. 
okay? Because it's not a battle of flesh and blood with respect to the spiritual warfare that we are involved in. That's what we're here for, okay? Um, but it's against the rulers, and this, th th we talked about this before. It's not only Satan, but Satan has what's called rulers. Those are the cosmocrators that we've talked about in the scripture, where they are the ones who are the world re le uh, leaders, um, not human beings, but angelic, powerful cosmocrators that have that power um, that we see. We see them in Daniel chapter 10 as the prince of, of uh, Persia and the prince of Greece. And it says against authorities, this is the next rank uh, in the devil's kingdom, okay? In the kingdom that we see referenced before. He has a structure. He has a authority structure uh, just like you see in the world by human beings. Why? It's because we copied that because that's a structure of organization. Satan can't create anything and doesn't, but he does copy what God does, even with his evil, because he doesn't have the ability to create anything on himself. So he sends the powers of the darkness of this world, and to get spiritual forces of evil, that's what we're talking about, and that's talking about uh, demons, in the heavenly realms. So we have those, if you look at here, those, those dark powers and those evil forces exist in the world, where we lived, and in the air, meaning both the air and in space, uh, in reality, even in the third heaven, in, in God's heaven himself, there are very specific ones of very high rank, like Satan, who have the ability to go there. They have access to it today. That access will end uh, when we run into uh, Revelation 12, right? It says here that he is also the original murderer. This is the next point. Uh, John 8, 44. Um, you, uh, you belong to your father, the devil. Now, if you remember, this is speak, spoken by Jesus, and he's talking to the religious uh, Pharisees and the rulers in Israel at the time. Note that he's talking about, he's saying essentially that they are unbelievers and that their father is Satan himself. So this is interesting because this is many times where you see Satan's most powerful work, and we'll talk about it later, uh, probably in the next lesson, his most powerful work is not in the evil stuff. It's actually within the religious community itself. Okay? I could have a lot of fun with that one. He says, and, and this is, he's still, Jesus is speaking, he says, and you, talking to the Pharisees, to carry out your father's desire. See? The strategy. That's what they do. Okay? This is the doctrine of demons. Um... He was a murderer from the beginning, with reference to Cain and Abel, and how Cain was incited by Satan to take the sacrificial knife that Abel used to sacrifice the lambs. And if you remember that story, where Cain refused to do that, okay? Uh, he wouldn't kill the lambs, but he was a farmer. Nothing wrong with being a farmer, but God will not accept uh, carrots as sacrifices, as, if you've noticed. And what happened, though, is that he incited Cain to take that same, that jealousy and anger that he had towards his brother Abel, to take that knife for his sacrifices of the lamb, because he was, he was a rancher, okay, and to cut Abel's throat with it, and, and, and so uh, murder him, to end that part. And we know that story, but that's the piece of it. He was a murderer from the beginning, talking about human history. Not holding to the truth, not holding to Bible doctrine. Okay, which forbids it. For there, uh, for there is no truth in him. That's, that is a reference to uh, Satan. Satan has no truth in him. Zero truth. He is always lying. He is always false. This is what we call false doctrine. And what happens, he disseminates that false doctrine. And when it sounds like it makes sense, what the genius would, in reality, it's related. Many times, as we, be, as we become after we become saved, the process we have is ridding ourselves of these false doctrines in order to understand God's Word. And we replace them with the Word of God and the principles of God. He says, when he lies, this is still in the verse, when he lies, talking about Satan, he speaks his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. He is a deceiver of the world. He speaks only the doctrine of demons, only his own principles, which are always in direct antagonism of the word of God and the truth of God 
God himself, and of those who speak the word of God. Okay? So that's what that means, is that in reality, he, meaning Satan, can never speak a true doctrine. He doesn't have the ability to, because true doctrine stands on its own. It is divine. Now the next piece here about, uh, on the part about Satan as a super creature, he is the opponent of Bible doctrine, meaning Bible principles. And I bring this from uh, Matthew 13, 19 and 39. And he says, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. This is the story of the reaping and sowing. If you remember that story, Jesus in that, in that uh, parable identifies who the antagonist is. He says the enemy who sows them, means the weeds, is the devil. He says the harvest is the end of the age, which means the end of Israel. Okay, and we know what that happens. That happens at the end of the tribulation. That's the end, end of the age of Israel. And the harvesters are angels. So what we find out is that the harvesters will be the angels. And we know from this parable that they will be the ones who implement the baptism of fire, which we've talked about, removing the unbelievers from the face of the earth and the tribulation of believers living through into the millennium. We covered that. Um, so in reality, what does he sow? He sows false doctrine. He sows a false gospel. He is the one who, sell, uh, who uh, has the gospel that if you just believe in God, or if you're just a good person, or if you just don't do bad, or if you're best better than the other guy, that's a false gospel. And we'll run into him in a minute. Uh, but false doctrine is that piece. And false religions. We have many, many false religions. Even within the church. We have many, many people who are who are have uh, more who are who have, in the name of Christianity, have more demonism than many of the others. Okay, um, he is the enemy. Next point of Satan under the same classification as he is the enemy of the church. Now, just to let you know, he's the enemy of the church today. But if you went back to the previous dis dispensation during the age of Israel, he was the enemy of the, of the Israelites and of the Jews. And one of the reasons he was is because they were God's representatives on earth. Today we are God's representative on earth. Now why does Satan persecute the Jews today uh, when the Jewish people, many of, them are not, uh, many of them are not believers, why does he still persecute them? It's because of the promises that God has to the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Palestinian covenant, all those promises that somehow the church, many of the church, have wiped out and say don't apply today. the reality they do apply, they just apply on the other side of the church. And they will be implemented because God's not a liar. He will implement them in truth and reality. Um, in that time. So if Satan can destroy the Jews, he can make God a liar by not allowing them to be there to receive those promises after the church is raptured. Hopefully that made sense. Okay? But he is the enemy of the church today. And this is in Revelation 2.24. He says, I say, I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, we're familiar with this one here, Church of Thyatira, one of the seven churches of, of Asia Minor, it says, to you uh, who do not hold to her teaching. Now, her teaching is a reference in this, in this church to Jezebel, if you remember, okay? Uh, so, to her teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Ah, that, what's the deep secrets? It says right here. It tells us right here. It identifies us in the Word of God that Satan has deep secrets, Okay? Uh, this is the black ma ma this is black magic, that kind of stuff that really does have power. It just doesn't have power over believers, but it has power over those who are not who are unbelievers, okay? Especially those who believe it. So these deep practices here are the doctrine of demons, okay? They are the doctrines of Satan himself. And then it says, "I will not." And the, the end of that piece is, "I will not impose any other burdens on you." And that was an instruction specifically to Thyatira, to those who were not participating in the teachings of Jezebel. But the, the good part is it, it lets us know that in reality Satan's greatest desire is to get the church off step, to actually accept some of his doctrines, just like these deep secret doctrines it's talking about here. And today we do have churches that participate in the deep secret, deep, 
see that over and over again, right? Into the deep secrets of Satan himself actually are participating in churches throughout America and throughout the world today. And we know that because we have a reference to it in Thyatira at the beginning of the first hundred years of the church itself. He is not Satan. He, he is, Satan is not shy. He's not afraid. Okay? So let's go to the second point here. Okay, this is, a, this is an important piece here, I think, is that many churches do not believe this to be true. Um, it says the devil is the ruler of this world. And I listed a whole bunch of verses. I could list probably five times that many. But in reality, he is the ruler of this world today and will rule until the Lord comes. Okay? So that is true. And that's what those verses all are. Um, what's important about that is that you will see people who do not believe in the millennium and they will say things like, you know, the Lord rule. He's ruling on his throne right now. Well, you know something? He is on that throne. He rules that kingdom. And he rules this part if you're a believer. But he does not rule this world. And that's what all these verses tell us. Anybody who says that is a liar, not because I say so, but because the word of God calls them a liar. And they are a blasphemer. Okay? So in reality, the other part is if you turn on the news and you watch it, and then you repeat to yourself that Jesus is ruling the world, you may have a little dilemma. Okay? Um, so let's go to Ephesians 2, 2, the one I picked out of this one. Uh, it says, in which you used to live, talking about to believers, the, the Ephesian uh, church believers, he says, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So we all followed them before we were, before we were uh, believers. And it's talking about the world itself. We followed the world. Just how the world, the principles that, that Satan has is called the world. That's, that's what he does. And those principles we live by too. And he says here, you followed them th that time too. And he says, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And that's Satan. Okay? The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And remember, that, that spirit that's written there is not the Holy Spirit, which is why it's small. It's talking about the spirit of lawlessness, okay? Which is the spirit of the Antichrist, which is the spirit of Satan himself. He is the rebeller, and he is the one who drives everybody um, to, to, to desire independence from God. So let's go to the third one. The devil has a the strategy, and that strategy is to deceive the human race. Um, and, I, and you're going to run into this verse, and what I want to key into is I use Revelation 12, 9. It says, the great dragon was hurled down, that was the part we were talking about, and when he gets hurled down out of, um, out of heaven during the middle of the tribulation. That ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, see that's so you don't miss it, He's a real person. He's a real being. He, that means that he can't be everywhere. He can only be at one place at one time because he's a creature. And in this piece, he is in heaven as a person, and they are throwing him out. If you remember the, the battle of, 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 uh, of the demons and Satan and uh, Michael and the archangels and the armies of God threw him out during the middle of the tribulation. But notice what it says here. Inserted here was the point I'm getting to. And it says this word, this word many places. Who deceives the whole world astray. Who leads the whole world astray. His job, his purpose, is like we said, is to deceive the whole human race. It is his job to do that. He has doing it. He does it all the time. He continues to do it. He has inserted his false teachers everywhere. Okay? And then it says, finish the verse where, where the context shows up. He says, he, he was hurled to earth and his angels with him. That's when they're all thrown out. So it also answers the question, is, is Satan in heaven today? Most likely. We don't know where he's at. Uh, but he's an individual, so he could be on the earth visiting, see how he's doing. He's doing pretty well lately. Okay, uh, But he could be up accusing uh, you of doing that last thing you did that he saw that you didn't. Actually, he didn't see it. One of his demons did. And God obviously always saw it and has always known about it. But that's his job. He, he is there to deceive us, and, and whenever, whenever you choose, uh, you are part of the choosing, but you are usually tempted by something he's giving you that you don't think that you have. So that's how he leads us astray, and we'll talk about that as we go along. But in reality, he is, his strategy is to deceive you 
and is to deceive the church and is to deceive the human race. <clears throat> now I broke it down to two pieces here. The very first one is um, unbelievers of the world. This is how he deceives them. Okay? Uh, the first one is to blind them. Now, he blinds them by allowing them to be captured by false doctrine. Okay? They really believe it. Now, this is a great thing to help us with, is that when you see some of these crazy left people on the left who are spouting all these things that sound absolutely insane, in reality, do they believe them? Yes, they do. They're not lying to you. In reality, that, they are that deceived. And that falls into Romans chapter 1, about verse 24 through 28, where it says they are, that, that God has given because they have rejected the Christ, because they have rejected God. God has given them a, a, a delusion that what they are thinking is true. He's allowed them to swallow the entire bait. Okay? And what that does is that blinds them. Okay? So people who are blinded to the gospel are because they believe the truth. And then Satan's job is to keep that blindness on them. It is great, Satan's greatest desire to keep all people from believing. Okay? That's his greatest desire. But he has a plan B. If he lost plan B, like he did with us, he's now going, he, he lost plan A, he's now going to plan B. That's to deceive believers. We'll get to that in a minute. But there's a plan A to have everybody, uh, all humans, not believe in Jesus Christ. And that's who he is. So the verse I selected here was uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. He says, yeah, there it is. Um, and always the wicked deceives those who are perishing. That means unbelievers who will never change, okay? Or even unbelievers in general because they are perishing uh, when, they, when, they, when they are an unbeliever, okay? They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Okay, so that's the truth of it. That's why, is that they choose, they refuse to love the truth. That's their problem, okay? And so be saved, because if they love that truth, which is the gospel, for an unbeliever, that's the only truth for them. In reality, they would be saved. So his job is to deceive them. The wickedness deceives those who are perishing. That's his main job, is to protect his little world and to have as many people um, not be saved. That is his great hope. He wants everybody to hate God like he hates God. Now, the other one I have here is religion is the devil's best enemy to God or against God would be better. Using it to blind them to the gospel. Okay? And, and I'm talking about religion in reality blinds both sides. Uh, religion blinds unbelievers in that they can become a Buddhist or they can become uh, a Jehovah Witness, I can, go, I can have lots of fun with this, uh, but they can believe a false doctrine and somehow think that they're going to become nirvana, they're going to come into heaven somehow. Um, so that's what religion's primary purpose is, is to give them something that satisfies them, that maybe even matches what they think is true, that that makes perfect sense. You know, and they believe in it, and so they are blinded by it. Now, I don't know about you, but the Word of God does not actually agree with what I think. It does today, but it didn't then. I've seen it work. But in reality, Satan uses every flavor in the world to make people believe that God is not who he says he is. And we know that from all the other religions that there are. And Satan uses that, and it's his false system, to... Uh, both deceive believers and unbelievers, okay? But we'll get to the believers in a second. Um, but the unbelievers, this over here, and I use the verse, he says it uses them to blind them to the gospel. Matthew 15, 14. Now notice what it does here. It says, this is Jesus speaking again, and he's speaking about religion, okay? He's talking about religion, not, in reality, Christianity is not a religion, okay? From the outside it is, but from the reality it is not. Why? It's because a person can be saved by believing in Christ and they are a Christian, end of conversation, whether they ever come to a church or ever read a Bible or ever pray again in their life. Because it says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Period. Okay? So, in reality, we are not a religion. We are a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by faith in Him. Okay? So, this verse here is uh, 15, 40, is he's talking about religion, okay? He says, leave them, they are blind guides. This is Jesus. And the blind guides here are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and so on. If the blind 
if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Okay? And that's what he's saying here. This is the unbeliever he's talking to. If the religious tell them that all they have to do is do this, this, and that, if they just obey the laws, obey the, the law of Moses, that they will go to heaven. Okay? That's what they told them. Okay? We know a guy, we run into a guy who believes that. But in reality, the law never saved anybody. There's always and only been one way to be saved, and that's believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Never been a second way. So he's telling them who are religious, because we already identified them as the sons of Satan, right? Um, that their guiding, their guidance, their religious guidance will bring them, th their, those who believe them, into the same pit that these Pharisees and religious leaders will go into. And that pit uh, is Hades. Now the third piece here we're going to go to is the strategy concerning believers. Okay, and I'll do this for about four more minutes and then we'll, we'll end it and come into the other pieces. Um, and the piece I used here was 2 Corinthians 11. Now, what he's doing with um, uh, Satan is that we have this verse that says, in order that Satan may not outwit us. Okay, now that's the key verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.11. So the strategy that he has towards us, he says, is for Satan that he might not, meaning potential, it might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Okay? How are schemes known to us? This class. Okay? Bible doctrine. When you have Bible doctrine, you know what Satan's doing. It is his desire to teach you, move you just off of the Word of God, just a little tiny bit. Okay? In reality, so that you are living a different life. Now, you're saved. He already knows you're saved. He can't fix that part. He wishes he could, but he can't fix it. Okay? So, what he will rather have you do is that he would rather have you, if I'll change you, and you can act like the world, and maybe I can even get you to do the things to become a, um, a gospel speaker for the world. Okay? Talk about how the world... Now, you see this happen in places all over. In churches today. People who are trying to uh, talk, to clean up the world, to somehow make it a better place. And we'll get to that. Okay? But that's not what God says. God says that the world is wicked. It's a wicked place. That's why I pulled you out of it. I saved you. I delivered you from that. Now you have a choice. The choice to serve me. Okay? And so it says that we, we, we are being taught the Word of God, and I am teaching this class just as as uh, Paul is talking here, to help you not become a victim of Satan's schemes, okay? That you might not be out, that Satan may not out with us, okay? And one of the things he does um, is he accuses us, okay? And uh, this comes from Zechariah 1. There's a whole bunch of verses, but Zechariah 3, 1, and 2 is the one I look at. This is a great example. We see one with, Josh, uh, with Job, too, but this is really a good one. And we know one from other verses. But it says in, in Zechariah 3, 1, and 2, it says, Then he showed me Joshua, uh, the high priest. Now, this isn't Joshua of the time of Moses. This is Joshua, the time of Zerubbabel and the return of the uh, Israel uh, to the... Um, um, to Jerusalem. And he says, he was the high priest, Joshua was. Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ, okay, before he was, before he was incarnate. And Satan standing at the right hand accusing him, accusing Joshua. Did Joshua sin? I'm sure he sinned quite a bit. That's why it's brought up here. And he was the high priest of Israel. Okay, we know he did because we know other parts of the scripture. Okay, he says the Lord uh, who has chosen, um, oh, that's, this, is, this is Jesus speaking here. He says, the Lord rebuke you. And this word we hear, Lord, is the tetragrammaton referring to the Father. Okay? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Uh, the Lord, uh, who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you, exclamation point. Is, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? What is that? Reality that Joshua, just like all of us, were going to be this. We're going to be the sticks that were thrown into the fire and burnt completely, meaning hell and Hades. But it says here he was snatched from the fire. Means that guess what? He sinned, but I am going to die on the cross for that sin, and Satan knows that. 
Okay? That's the entire scheme. So he is redeemed. That's why he is forgiven. He is our, in reality, Jesus himself is saying, you know something? I know what Richard did the other day and nobody else knows. Satan, I have one of my demons watching him. He did that stuff. He shouldn't be a teacher of the word of God. Well, that's true. I shouldn't be. But by the grace of God, I am. But in reality, Jesus defending me in heaven as the mediator of his people would sit down and say, let me see, uh, right there, I died for that sin. It's right there. Paid for, done, finished. And he does that over and over and over. Does it ever stop Satan from accusing us? No. Does it ever stop the left from speaking lies? No, they, don't, they just keep lying. Okay? They don't care how much truth a liar is a liar. And if you expect them to do anything other than lie, who's the crazy one? Okay? Although we yell at the TV sometimes too. So the second piece right here is the sponsor of reversionism. This is the words I used before. It's by theme. It's a great means. It's a Christian who drives his life uh, in reverse, his entire life. He just drives backwards, okay? Uh, with all the repercussions that come with that. Not much blessing in driving backwards. He, he, reversionism in all of its forms, which means that many of us have a false viewpoint of, uh, of good and evil. And that false viewpoint is that some of the things that we see as being okay in the church, in reality, God hates and detests. Okay? So I'm going to read this one, then I'm going to give you that verse so you can look at it. But I've given it to you many times. Um, and all of the... Um, possibilities that Christians, can, and I'm talking about Christians, this is the context, can commit, create, and do evil um, are many times not recognized by the church because we look at what's called the wicked wicked, you know. We, we look at the overt sins, but most of the sins that are created by the church and are actually detested and hated by God, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, my turn, we may touch it next week. In reality, only one of the seven things that God absolutely hates, hates, and detests, from God's standard, only one of them is overt. Okay? So, this is the lesson to the church. In reality, all the gossiping and all the conniving and all the scheming that goes on in churches and does is the very stuff that God hates the most. And the fact that the church doesn't hate it more is what convicts it of being a, a, a user of false doctrine. Should stop right there, huh? So, what I'm not going to do, I'm going to do the sponsor of them, and then we'll come back to the other part. And I use uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Um, he says, But I'm afraid, just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, talking about believers here, may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure Devotion to Christ. Check that out. Now, what this means is that, you know something, many believers, including ourselves, and we have to understand this, have a pure and sincere, I use the word sincere because sincere means that you have the right intentions but you're not smart enough to actually carry them out. That's what sincerity mostly means. I really, really want to say, I love the Lord! But when God gives you something that's tough, you fall apart. Why is that? Because your sincerity can't carry you. What can carry you? The truth of the Word of God. Okay? The power of the Holy Spirit. And in that, the Christian always has to take refuge. Because none of us are powerful and none of us are smart when it comes to God's truth. In reality, the serpent's mind is cunning, just like it says here. He's always thinking, always thinking about how to take you out. And one of his demons watches you regularly sorry to tell you that, to find out what your foibles are, what your little weaknesses are, and he wants to take you out so that you will not serve the Lord effectively. So let's end it there. We'll come back to the next piece, which is the neutralization of Bible doctrine and how Satan does that uh, next week. And then we'll get into um, some of my favorite part, which is about the church itself. So let's, pr let's pray. Dearest, gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great love for us. I pray, Lord, help us not to kick this stuff aside. This is how Satan takes us out. This is how he neutralizes our witness. This is how he, he neutralizes our effectiveness. The church is significantly neutralized by its lack of Bible doctrine. Not from its sincerity, 
not from its emotions, not by its desire, but by the truth that it fails to understand. I ask these things in the Lord's name, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.